Hello and welcome back to Bible Scribe. Today we're going to look at how the early church fathers confirm preterism. They confirm the ideas of a historical fulfillment of Christ's coming, foretold by the prophets in the Old Testament. And so what we're going to do is go through, in a chronological order, go through a lot of the early church fathers and show you, church father by church father, how they supported exactly what happened and what preterists and historicists feel happened in the first century with Christ's return. Uh, and that will be supported in many different ways throughout these writings, but we're going to look at each of these church fathers. Uh, we're going to take a brief kind of detour in the middle to talk about also some of the ideas of the church fathers on the Septuagint, because it's it's uh, important to this discussion to see that well, some of the things they believe about the, the Septuagint and the Hebrew texts at the time and what was happening, which also lends confirmation to the idea that uh, Jesus was who he said he was, and that was in contradiction to what the Jews were expecting, and that uh, he did fulfill the prophecies, thereby embittering the Jewish people. Uh, but regardless, there is a lot to go through, a lot of these different church fathers. We're going to go from the time of Christ, we're going to go all the way forward into about the fourth century. Uh, I personally have a conviction that past, too far past the third and fourth century, you get into the start of the Catholic Church and the ideas that came out of the Council of Nicaea, and uh, you know, a lot of ideas changed in Christianity during that time. So. When I study these kinds of things, I go up to about the point of 400 AD, and then I usually uh, stop at that point. But uh, this will be good. We're going to go through a lot. I will try to give you every reference for what I have pulled on the screen so you can uh, take note and do your own study. But uh, let's get started. Let's get into it. So the first church father we're going to look at is Clement, Clement of Rome. And in his first epistle to the Corinthians, he says this, Of a truth quickly and suddenly shall his will be accomplished, the scripture also bearing witness to it, saying he shall come quickly and shall not tarry, and the Lord shall come suddenly into his temple, even the Holy One, whom ye expect. So we do need to realize when Clement said this, uh, and I'll try to give you the dates on everything we go through, but Clement would have been writing in the middle of the first century, so around, I put this at about 55 AD. Uh, so Clement of Rome to the Corinthian church, the same Corinthian church that Paul wrote to. And so saying here that at that time, you know, in 50 or 55 AD, they were expecting Christ to come still. And so that's one of the things as we look at these church fathers that's going to help us place their beliefs is when were they expecting Christ and then when were they not expecting Christ? Because if Christ came in 70 AD, then prior to that they would be expectant of his coming and talking about it's coming quickly, it's coming soon for us because they would have been alive at the time. And then we would expect after 70 AD for their writings to reflect that it had been done, things had been accomplished, uh, prophecies fulfilled, and that the only thing left after that in history and prophecy would have been the end of the earth, the end of time, the destruction of the earth, a final destruction by fire that, of course, was in prophecies since ancient times. And, and what we're going to do is we're going to see exactly that as we go through these guys. But here's Clement in about 50 to 55 AD saying they were expectant still of Christ to come. Now, the next writing we're going to look at is the Didache. And, you know, scholars, of course, on, and by the way, scholars on all the writings we're looking at, they give a wide range, most sources for these documents give a wide range of dating for them. And the reason they do that is because you have secular scholars in the field. You have Christian scholars. You have what I consider to be good Christian scholars and not so good Christian scholars in the field. Uh, 
Uh, and so all those voices together is what the 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 uh, you know field of research will agree is a range for the writing to have been written. Well, the Didache is is known by almost all scholars to be one of the earliest Christian writings that was used in the churches as an instruction book, a guide for new Christians, and. You know, so you have some scholars, though, that will put it all the way out at 100 AD, which is patently ridiculous. This writing was definitely, uh, as many scholars agree, <laughs> was written in the middle of the first century. Again, just like Clement of Rome's writings, this was instructions for these early, early Christians. And so, again, I place this around 55 AD. Uh, you know, I choose usually that for most of the earliest church writings because it's before a lot of the persecution started by, for instance, Nero and some of the emperors leading up to 70 AD. Uh, so, you know, you would assume that in a time of turmoil like the persecutions of Nero that not a lot of writings would be written. So, you know, a good assumption, a good common sense principle is that they probably wrote and used many of these letters and writings before that time period. So between Christ's ascension, 30-ish AD, and 60, 65 AD, probably is when all of these writings were written, these earliest Christian writings. Again, I put the Didache at about 55 AD. But the Didache says this, it's a, it's a bit of a section on the Lord's coming, but it, it's it's very parallel to what the New Testament talks about. Let's read through this. Watch for your life's sake. Let not your lamps be quenched. Let not your loins be loosed, but be ye ready. So again, this idea of these Christians in the early first century, mid first century, 55 AD, being ready themselves. It's not saying for any future generation to be ready. This is telling the people who are reading this, be ready. For ye know not the hour in which the Lord cometh. These are quotes from the New Testament. So we know that it's the same things being said, the same ideas being communicated. But as often as you come together seeking the things that are befitting to your souls, for that whole time of your faith will not profit you if you are not made perfect in the last time. They considered these the last days, the last time. For in the last days, false prophets and corruptors shall be multiplied, and sheep turned into wolves, and love will be turned to hate. When the lawlessness increases, they shall hate and betray one another. They shall appear, then shall appear the world deceiver as a son of God. And he will do signs and wonders. The world will be deceived into his hands. Now, just a, a little side note here. I've done a lot of research, and I feel like this deceiver that does signs and wonders is Simon Magus, who was known in the first century. He was traveling around the different areas of Rome doing deceptive magic, using demons, using conjuring, all these different techniques to deceive and turn people away from Christ. Uh, that's, that is recorded in other, other texts, specifically the Acts of Peter, if you want to find that one. It's a, a really good one. So it does say that then shall appear this world deceiver as son of God and shall do signs and wonders. The world shall be delivered into his hands. He shall do iniquitous things which have never yet come to pass since the beginning. Then the creation of men shall come to the fire of trial. Now, of course, 70 AD, there was a lot of fire involved in Jerusalem, fire all over the city. The temple burned down. Uh, so this is, you know, speaking directly to those things that would occur in these people's lifetimes. And many shall be made to stumble and perish, but they that endure in the faith shall be saved from under the curse itself. And then shall appear the signs of truth. First, the sign of the outspreading in heaven, then the sound of the trumpet, and the third, the resurrection from the dead. Yet not all, but as it is said, the Lord is coming, and all his saints with him, then the world will see the Lord coming on the clouds of heaven. So these things, these miraculous things being talked about, we actually have record in Josephus of many of these types of miraculous things. Uh, 
Now, was everyone, was a, a person there with a pen and paper to record the occurrence of every single event? Probably not. But we did see uh, different signs in the heavens at that time. Stars that stayed in, uh, a star that looked like a sword or possibly a cross staying in the sky for an entire year while people just stared at it wondering what in the world is this star sitting there for. Uh, we had times when people saw armies of spiritual beings, angels, so to speak, running through the heavens, through the clouds. We had uh, different times when strange sounds were heard. Perhaps this was the sound of the trumpet it speaks of. The resurrection of the dead we have recorded in the book of Matthew, as well as uh, the gospel of Nicodemus, that there were dead people that physically were arisen to show that the resurrection had occurred at the time of around 70 AD. And then, of course, the whole idea of this historical fulfillment and what they said was coming and did come in 70 AD was that Christ did come in the clouds. It was this coming that was not, uh, it was not Christ landing his feet on earth again, but it was in the clouds and his saints with him, and that the whole world saw this. It was a, a, a miraculous occurrence in 70 AD, so many things happening. But just so you know that these miraculous things talked about in the early, mid, first century truly did come to pass in the lifetimes of these hearers. So, so just to say that, you know, I'm not using that as an argument for this writing, but I'm just telling you that because we see this writing saying these people would see these things, and then we have records in history of miraculous things, that seems to be a match. So now as we go forward, we're looking more at some writers, uh, Christian writers, from after 70 AD. So you're going to see the change in tone, whereas Clement and the Didache were talking about it coming quickly on you, you know, be ready to the, the hearers they were writing about. And we see that also in the New Testament, which the New Testament writings, specifically of Paul, were very early, just like these writings. So they are saying, you know, be ready. You know not the hour in which he comes. He will come quickly, and he will come in the clouds. They said all these things in the New Testament. So this is all during the same time period. Now we're moving past 70 AD to see what Christians after that occurrence in 70 AD, what they said about it looking back. And I think you'll realize as we go through that they seem to be speaking of it in the correct way. So in 100 AD, we have Ignatius writing an epistle to the Ephesian church. And so in chapter 1 of that epistle, he says, Trusting through your prayers to be permitted to fight with beasts at Rome, so that by martyrdom I may indeed become the disciple of him who gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God. So this is just actually a, a reference of Ignatius referring back to Christ's death as sacrifice, the offering and sacrifice for them in this current time period. But further on in this writing, he goes a little further and gives us more about that coming in 70 AD. He says, the last times are come upon us. Let us therefore be of a reverent spirit and fear the long suffering of God, that it tend not to our condemnation, for let us either stand in awe of the wrath to come or show regard for the grace in which is at the present displayed one of two things. One, in one way or another, let us be found in Jesus Christ unto the true life. So in this section, he is referring, as he says here, let us stand in awe of the wrath to come. The wrath to come being the final judgment and destruction of the earth. Whereas, he recognized already that Christ provided the grace in which they now stand. And of course, as of 100 AD or so, I think that this couches Ignatius' thought in that same, you know, thought cycle of Christ came, he fulfilled, and now the only thing left as we are in the last days is the destruction of all things and the final judgment. And you're going to see that theme played out in many of these different writings we're going to look at.
So shortly after Ignatius, we have Polycarp writing in about 110 AD to the Philippian church. And he says this in chapter 2, verse 1, Ye have believed on him that raised our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead and gave him unto glory, or excuse me, gave unto him glory and a throne on his right hand. So Polycarp recognizing that Christ had died and raised and been put at the right hand of the Father in heaven. Then verse 2 he says, Now he that has raised him from the dead will raise us also. So he's recognizing that all Christians in that time frame, 110 AD and forward likely, would also be raised from the dead after their death, right? Not to be risen physically to sit on earth again, but be raised from the dead to go to heaven. Okay, that's what the resurrection means. Polycarp continues in chapter 5, verse 2 by saying, For if we be well pleasing unto him in this present world, we shall receive the future world also, according as he promised to raise us from the dead, and that if we conduct ourselves worthily of him, we shall also reign with him, if indeed we have faith. So this is Polycarp recognizing the reign of Christ in heaven and that if we run the race correctly, he promised to raise us, to resurrect us and take us there in the world to come, he says. So again, reinforcing all the ideas, you know, essentially uh, this is the ideas that I teach in many of my videos, but it's it's the same ideas all of these guys have, and I think you'll continue to see that as we go forward. But Polycarp continues in chapter 6, he says, We must all stand at the judgment seat of Christ, and each man must give an account of himself, as he himself gave commandment, and the apostles who preached the gospel to us, and the, the prophets who proclaimed beforehand the coming of our Lord. Okay, so there's a lot there, but he's saying we all will stand, will, future tense, stand at the judgment seat of Christ. And then in verse 3, he says, he talks about the apostles who preached the gospel to us, but also the prophets who beforehand proclaimed the coming of our Lord. Past tense. So, they had proclaimed Christ's coming, and he is saying it in a way that assumes the coming of the Lord had already happened. Not that it was going to happen. He's speaking in past tense of all these things. So this is a very good example of Polycarp recognizing the, the point in history in which they sat, which was Christ had come, he had done all these things, fulfilled the prophets, the apostles then preached that gospel, and then we, at some point, will die, be resurrected, and sit at the judgment seat of Christ. Chapter 7, verse 1, Polycarp says, Whoever shall pervert the oracles of the Lord to his own lust to say that there is neither resurrection nor judgment, that man is the firstborn of Satan. So reinforcing the idea that we just read in the past chapter, that there is a resurrection for every person after death, and there is a judgment for every person. And, you know, we can sit here for a second and say, is he talking about a judgment per person, like a specific judgment for every person after their death when they are resurrected? Or is he talking about one at the end, like in Revelation chapter 20, where it says every man, all the dead, will be judged? It's hard to understand from this passage exactly which one is being talked about. You know, it could be, as far as my understanding, that each person, when they die, at, up until the end, each person will stand in judgment before Christ, uh, in, personally. But then at the end of the earth, at the final judgment, that all the rest who have not died or who are still in Hades or all these different... All the rest would then be judged. That would be the great white throne judgment. So it is possible that's what we're seeing here. Uh, and that does add a little clarity. But just to say that idea is there. But again, Polycarp professing that every man will be raised, resurrected, and will be judged in front of Christ. In chapter 11, he says, Nay, know we not that the saints shall judge the world as Paul teaches. 
So confirming that the saints reigning in heaven next to Christ on his throne would be judging the world, as it said. And then in chapter 12, Polycarp says this, and he, and may he grant unto you a lot and portion among his saints and to us with you and to all that are under heaven who shall believe on the Lord and God Jesus Christ and on his father that raised him from the dead. So that portion among the saints is something Polycarp talks about a lot. This is why we understand he reinforced that the saints reign with God, with Christ and God in heaven, and that he wanted to be a part of that, and that we could all be a part of that and, and reign with him in heaven after death, after you were resurrected, stood before Christ, and then went to heaven. So uh, I think that paints a good picture of what Polycarp believed in around 110 AD. And we also have a writing in the late 1st century, maybe early 2nd, called the Epistle of Barnabas. I put it at around 100 AD. And in chapter 16, it talks a lot about the judgment of the Jews and the temple. Let's read through this real quick. Moreover, I will tell you likewise concerning the temple, how these wretched men being led astray set their hope on the building and not on their God that made them, as being a house of God. For like the Gentiles, almost they consecrated him in the temple. But what saith the Lord abolishing the temple? Learn ye, who hath measured the the heaven with a span, or hath measured the earth with his hand? Have not I, saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne, the earth the footstool of my feet? What manner of house will ye build for me? What shall be my resting place? Ye perceive that their hope is in vain. Furthermore, he saith again, Behold, they that pulled down this temple themselves shall build it. So it comes to pass, for because they went to war, it was pulled down by their enemies. Now also the very servants of the enemies shall build it up. So in this passage, he's talking about the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, saying that because the Jews put their hope in the temple and their law and their practices instead of their God, who gave them all of that, that it was pulled down by the Romans. It was destroyed. In verse 5 there, it says, Again, it was revealed how the city and the temple and the people of Israel should be betrayed. For the scripture said, And it shall be in the last days that the Lord shall deliver the sheep of the pasture and the fold of the tower thereof to destruction. He's specifically talking about 70 AD here. And it came to pass as the Lord spake. He's saying it happened. It's over with. Just as the prophecies foretold. Verse 6, But let us inquire whether there be any temple of God. There is in the place where he himself undertakes to make and finish it. For it is written, And it shall come to pass when the week is being accomplished, meaning Daniel's 70th week, The temple of God shall be built gloriously in the name of the Lord. So we also have Justin Martyr. In around 150 AD or so, he's writing these writings. In his first apology, he says this, He, Christ, should be believed on by men of every race, and how God calls him his son, and has declared that he will subdue all enemies under him, and how the devils as much as they can, strive to escape the power of God the Father, the Lord of all, and the power of Christ himself, and how God calls all to repentance before the day of judgment comes. Now, this would couch this writing and Justin Martyr's ideas as being before the great day of judgment, the final judgment, the, the j- day of judgment mentioned in Revelation 20, where we call it the great, great white throne judgment. And so Justin Martyr here couching himself in the same time period, uh, you know, understanding the same things, that for them at this time period, the only thing left prophetically was the end, the, the final judgment, the final destruction, that the, the coming of Christ had occurred. Also, in his first apology, Justin Martyr says this, 
and that the God, the Father of all, would bring Christ to heaven after he raised him from the dead, and would keep him there until he had subdued his enemies, the devils, and until the number of those are foreknown by him as good and virtuous is complete, on whose account he has delayed the consummation. You're going to hear this word, the consummation, if you read through the early church fathers. You hear this word often, and it's related specifically to the final destruction of the world, consummation by fire of the world, whereas they all talk about, too, they or many of them, including Josephus, talks about a consummation by water that occurred on earth, right? That's Noah's flood, but that a final consummation of fire would occur. And that's what most of these early church fathers see in their future. So they see in the past Christ's coming and 70 AD, the destruction of the temple and the Jewish nation and the, all of the, the, the old covenant passing away and a new covenant in Christ. But then this time period they're all in, they're expecting to die, be resurrected, taken to heaven to reign with the saints, and that in the future there would be this final judgment and a consummation of the earth. That's what they all are looking at and talking about. So again, as you see, we're not seeing, we're not going to see, because they just had an implicit understanding of these things and the time period they lived in. You're not going to see an early church father say, preterism is true. You're not going to see an early church father say, Jesus is not coming in the future. They ha- it was implicit to them. They didn't talk about a second, another coming of Christ in the future because implicitly they, and, you know, common sense, they, they saw that as past. So they just didn't talk about it a lot other than saying, yes, the Jews were judged. Yes, Christ came and went to heaven. He's reigning. And in fact, we've now seen a couple places where they said he either was coming in the clouds or he did come in judgment and all those things happened. So I just want you to understand as we're going through these, you're you're not going to see someone say all the specific things that you probably want to hear as a preterist. They're not going to sit there and go down the line of all of the preterist talking points. But what they are is they are in the moment. They are recognizing this, the time period they're in. They're recognizing either the things coming in the future or they're recognizing what already happened. But you're not going to see them play out all the fine points of a preterist doctrine in one little passage. They don't do that because they're not preterists. They are early Christians. And so they will confirm a lot of preteristic or historical doctrine because it's truth to them. And so by being in and honest about the time period they're in and what has happened and what will happen, they are confirming a historical view of Christ's coming. So at this point, let's take a little detour from just specific mentions of, you know, Christ's coming or the destruction of the temple, because the same time period, we have a lot of the early church fathers talking about the Septuagint. And the reason they were talking about the Septuagint is because they also were seeing that the Jews were changing texts. They were changing Hebrew texts at the time. And this is important because... See, we have to understand logically what would happen if Christ did return in 70 AD, which he did. But assuming he did, what would then be the outcome for the Jews? They would be upset. They would be bitter. They would probably try to obscure the fact that he fulfilled all the prophecies in the Bible, in the Old Testament. And the the source for those prophecies as of the time of Christ and shortly thereafter into this Christian age was the Septuagint. It was the de facto standard at the time of Christ. And so if Christ comes and fulfills all these things and the Septuagint confirms he was the one that was going to do it because he fulfilled all those things that were written in the Septuagint, What would the Jews probably do, assuming they did not agree with Christ, did not want to see him as Messiah, did not want to accept that what happened was God's judgment on them? Well, they would probably try to to modify or hide their texts 
that confirm that he was the one. And in fact, that's what we see in these early church fathers. So for instance, Justin Martyr in 160 AD, he says this, he says, the interpretation made by the 70 elders who were with Ptolemy of the Egyptians is a correct one, and they attempt to frame another, meaning the Jews attempt are attempting to write another interpretation at the time. This is the 2nd century, 160 AD. So this interpretation of the 70 elders he's talking about, that's the Septuagint. That's where the name Septuagint comes from, is the 70 Jewish elders who in about 258 uh, BC, 250 years before Christ, 70 Jewish elders got together and did the translation of the Greek Septuagint. So he's saying that has been the accepted standard, and he's saying we see the Jews attempting to reinterpret the scriptures again at the current time in 200, or uh, the second century, 160 AD. And Justin Martyr goes on further to say that the Jewish teachers have altogether taken away many of the scriptures from the translation of the 70. So they were removing things from the Septuagint if they could, trying to. Uh, and, and what we will find is that they were really just redoing their Hebrew scriptures and then doubling down on that the Hebrew scriptures they had were going to be the correct ones, not the Septuagint any longer, even though they had been using the Septuagint all that time for centuries up until the time of Christ. Well, when Christ came, everything changed, <laughs> and they were so bitter. So we also see Irenaeus in the second century, about 180 AD, he writes this, The Lord himself saved us, giving us the sign of the virgin. But it is not as some allege who are now presuming to expound the scripture as, Behold, a young woman will conceive, as Theodotion the Ephesian has interpreted, and Aquila of Pontus, both Jewish proselytes. So this is the passage in Isaiah that prophesies Jesus will be born of a virgin. The Messiah would be born of a virgin. But this is Irenaeus in the second century saying, the Jews are now trying to change that to a young woman, not virgin. They're trying to change the word in Hebrew. And this is actually a modern argument the Jews have against Christ being the Messiah because they go to this passage in Isaiah and say, no, look here in our Masoretic text, it says it's a young woman, not necessarily a virgin. And so this started in the second century, this idea, this argument between the Jews and non-Jews about Isaiah, I believe it's chapter 9, verse 6, if I'm not mistaken, but don't take me to the bank on that. This idea that it's just a young woman or is it a virgin? Because if it's a virgin, then Jesus is the only man in history ever to be said to have been born from a virgin and have multiple accounts of evidence of that. No one else in history. So this is a key point, and Irenaeus saying that this Theodotion and Aquila, both Jewish proselytes, were trying to change this and, and reinterpret that scripture. We also have Hippolytus in 205 AD saying, at this point we have an asterisk. The words are found in the Hebrew, but do not occur in the Septuagint. So again, showing that as late as 205 AD, he was still seeing the Jews adding things into the Hebrew scriptures of the Old Testament that were not in the Septuagint. Whereas the Septuagint had been accepted by the Jews for centuries and was written by Jews themselves, ancient Jews that were probably more adept at it than the, the Jews of this time period in 200 AD. So, just more evidence that this was occurring. And then finally, we have Origen in 240 AD, all the way into the third century, saying the same thing. He says, I make it my endeavor not to be ignorant of their various readings, meaning the Jews, various interpretations of the Old Testament. Otherwise, in my controversies with the Jews, I might quote to them what is not found in their copies. Also, I want to make use of what is found there, even though it is not in our scriptures. So 
regardless of what Origen is saying about using their scriptures or not using them, he makes this point confirming that the Jews had differences in their texts from the Septuagint by saying our scriptures, generally that as you know, Christians would say that it means the Septuagint. So again, we have now four different examples in and around the second century that are saying the Jews changed their texts after the time of 70 AD, after the time of Christ, after he came and proved all these things and fulfilled all these different prophecies from the Old Testament that were recorded in the modern version, the Septuagint, for their time, version of the Old Testament scriptures that the Jews themselves used, they then started, because of Christ, they changed things. They wanted things to be different so that you could not say that Christ was the Messiah, which he was. So kind of continuing from this point now forward in history a little bit, we come to Tertullian in 180 AD, again, the end of the second century. He says this in Against Marcion, but we do confess that a kingdom is promised to us upon the earth, although before heaven, only in another state of existence, inasmuch as it will be after the resurrection of a thousand years in the divinely built city of Jerusalem. So here we have Tertullian looking forward to the New Jerusalem that's in Revelation chapter 21 and 22. He calls it divinely built. He says they will be in another state of existence. And he says also it's after the resurrection of the thousand years. So if you'll remember in Revelation chapter 20, at the end of the thousand years, it says there's a second resurrection. Now, you know, I've tried to teach on some of those things. It's a very complicated idea, but it sounds like there was a majority of the resurrection at the time of 70 AD when Christ came in the clouds, and that after the millennial reign, thousand years, there would be a second resurrection. And it seems to be here what Tertullian is talking about. So he recognizes he's in the middle of the thousand year reign, and that at the end of that, there will be another resurrection. And that at that time, he expects what is in Revelation 21 with the New Jerusalem, the divine city of Jerusalem. So we can see here that Tertullian agrees with the time frame he's in being what we would agree with in a historical viewpoint of Christ's coming. Christ came in 70 AD, the judgments occurred <clears throat> for Jerusalem. And then as he was inside the 1,000 year reign, as he is admitting here, he looks forward to the new Jerusalem in the future and that second resurrection at the end of the thousand years. Origen in 220 AD says this in his writing against Celsus. Above all, it is necessary to show, as against the assertions of Celsus, which follow those he has already made, that the prophecies regarding Christ are true predictions. For a reign himself at the same time against both parties, against Jews on the one hand that deny the advent of Christ has taken place, but who expect it as future, and against Christians on the other who acknowledge that Jesus is the Christ spoken of in prophecy, he makes the following statement, but that certain Christians and all Jews should maintain the former that there has already descended the latter, that there will descend upon the earth a certain God or Son of God who will make the inhabitants of the earth righteous, is a most shameless assertion, and one that the refutation, and and one the refutation of which does not need many words. So here we have Origen in his arguments against this man Celsus, in the third century, early third century, saying that contrary to what Celsus has said, that. The, the Jews who deny the advent of Christ took place, they are wrong because they expect it to be in the future. He's saying that view is wrong to expect Christ to come in the future from 220 AD. But he's saying the Christians are correct. They say that Christ was the one spoken of in prophecy. And further on, Origen says this, but according to Celsus, the Christians making certain additional statements to those of the Jews assert that the Son of God has already been sent on account of the sins of the Jews. 
and that the Jews, having chastised Jesus and given him gall to drink, have brought upon themselves the divine wrath. And any one who likes may convict this statement of falsehood, if it be not the case that the whole Jewish nation was overthrown within one single generation after Jesus had undergone these sufferings at their hands. For forty and two years, I think, after the date of the crucifixion of Jesus, did the destruction of Jerusalem take place. So you have to read kind of in, not between the lines, but just understand what's happening here is that Celsus was arguing against some of the claims of the Jews and Christians, whereas Origen was affirming them. And of course, Celsus saying in his statement that that's falsehood, right? But then Celsus does admit that 42 years or so after the crucifixion of Jesus, the destruction of Jerusalem took place. So, Origen confirming that those things were the fulfillments of the prophecies of Christ, of Messiah. And then, of course, he's arguing against Celsus, who is denying some of those things. So, if you can understand kind of where that all goes, you see that Origen confirms a historical viewpoint of the coming of Christ and the destruction of the Jewish nation, the Jewish temple. We also then have Eusebius in about 300 AD saying things like this in his writing, Demonstratio Evangelica. For we must understand by, quote, the end of the days, or the last days, that the end, it was the end of the national existence of the Jews. What then did he say they must look for? The cessation of the rule of Judah, the destruction of their whole race, the failing and ceasing of their governors, the abolition of the dominant kingly position of the tribe of Judah, and the rule of and kingdom of Christ, not over Israel, but over all nations, according to the word, this is the expectation of the nations. And of course, that's referenced out of the Old Testament. But Eusebius here saying that that was expected. This is exactly what their, quote, last days was. It was the end of the Jewish nation, the last days of the age of Judaism, the Jewish age, which of course in the older prophets was marked by 12 periods of Jewish rule on earth, and that that was the end as far as rule on earth for the Jewish nation. And Eusebius continues further on in the Demonstratio Evangelica, the Holy Scriptures foretell there will be unmistakable signs of the coming of Christ. Now there were among the Hebrews three outstanding offices of dignity which made the nation famous. Firstly, the kinship, kingship. Secondly, that of the prophet. Lastly, that of the priesthood. The prophecy said the abolition and destruction of all these three together would be the sign of the presence of the Christ. And that the proofs that the times had come would lie in the ceasing of the Mosaic worship, the desolation of Jerusalem and its temple, and the subjection of the whole Jewish race to its enemies. The holy oracles foretold all these changes, which had not been made in the days of the prophets of old, would take place at the coming of the Christ, the Messiah, which I will presently show to have been fulfilled as never before in accordance with the predictions. This is as clear as it's going to get, guys. Eusebius here saying that all those predictions for the Jewish nation occurred in the past. Of course, he's talking about in the first century in 70 AD, when all these things happened. The, the destruction of the priesthood, the temple, Jerusalem, the, the Jewish kings would be brought down. All of it. And that in the end, it was Christ who would then reign. And reign not only over Judah, but over all kingdoms of earth. And so that's exactly what Christ did in the first century, with what he did with the temple in 70 AD, and then establishing the kingdom before God, of all of us, of Christianity. And that includes Jews now, of course. It's everyone. So Eusebius really confirming a lot of things at once here for us. This is as clear as it's going to get with all of these church fathers, because they, again, they assumed it all to be true. And so not many of them sat down and said, yes, of course all those things were fulfilled, because that's what, to them, it was ridiculous. Of course those things were fulfilled. We saw it happen. Our fathers and grandfathers watched it occur. 
Then the last church father that we're going to go over is Orosius. And in book seven of his Christian history, he says this, After the capture and overthrow of Jerusalem, as the prophets had foretold, and after the total destruction of the Jewish nation, Titus, who had been appointed by the decree of God to avenge the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, celebrated with his father Vespasian in his victory by a triumph, and closed the temple of Janus. Very interesting. So here, Orosius confirming the significance of the overthrow of Jerusalem. As he said, the prophets had foretold. And after the total destruction, he says, Titus and Vespasian, they had been appointed by God to avenge the blood of Christ against the Jewish nation. A very interesting perspective, and, and one that does ring true with other things in the Old Testament, where God appointed certain leaders at certain times, for instance, Nebuchadnezzar, to overthrow the Jews or conquer in a way of punishment, in a, a time of um, you know, vengeance or punishment for wickedness uh, of judgment. So guys, thanks for joining me. I hope that all of this makes sense. And as you have read, as you know, as, as I did when I read through these early church fathers, I saw not that they came and explained every tenet of historicism or preterism to me, but what they do is they couch themselves in the time period they live in. And it's, of course, instinctive to them. It's natural to them. It's common sense. So some of it they don't always explain altogether. But as you saw, as they talk about what time period we're in, what we're expecting, what has happened before us, you start to see that they recognize the same truths that we are finding out. They recognize that the judgment in 70 AD was exactly what the prophets had talked about, that it occurred, that Christ established the kingdom at that time. So that would include all the prophecies about his coming, of course, his one coming. None of these guys you didn't see. And, and of course, we didn't do an exhaustive read of all these, these early church fathers. But if you do that, you will see none of them talking about Christ coming again. Uh, you will be very hard pressed to find anything like that at all, other than a judgment. Now, again, sometimes people do include Christ in the final judgment. And uh, so that's not an uncommon thing to hear about. But you won't hear about uh, the coming of Christ involving, you know, rescuing the saints again after it's already occurred. That all occurred. So again, these writers in the early 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th century couched themselves in the time they knew they were in, the time of the 1,000 years, the time of the reign of Christ with the saints on their thrones in heaven, as we saw Polycarp talking about and others. So I, I hope this has helped you see that these early church fathers, they don't ever come out and say preterism, but they say exactly what we would expect them to say, knowing that Christ fulfilled the prophecies and that that part was past and that the part in the future was a final judgment and a destruction of the earth, a consummation. So they have all couched themselves in that time period and affirmed with what we saw about the, the Jews trying to change the Hebrew texts after Christ came in the successive centuries because they, of course, wanted to obscure Christ. They wanted to disqualify Christ from being the Messiah because if he was, then they have to recognize it. And they didn't want to do that, of course. So this has been a lot of fun. Thank you guys for joining me on this journey into these early church fathers to see this stuff. And I hope it has solidified your understanding of what happened in the first century and, and realize that it, that idea was supported throughout early Christianity. It's only in the later modern times where people start having different ideas because time goes by and people forget and people tend to be impatient like, oh, well, if stuff hasn't happened, then I'm going to change all my beliefs on this stuff. And so they make things up. But we can see from the early church fathers that they were right down the line saying all the things that we're learning about that are evidently plain in Scripture. And they confirmed those things. So, again, for me, this has been great. Thank you guys for joining me. God bless you and your research.